I start this video in silent respect this Memorial Weekend. For those many who never came back and for those that serve, protecting our freedom and ways of life. And to all the soldiers, pilots, sailors and servicemen, we remember all of you today, this Memorial Weekend. God bless you and God bless America. Good morning, good day, good evening, whatever part of the world you're coming from and watching this channel. Thank you very much for tuning in. Anyway, I hope you guys are have I hope you guys have a good Memorial Day weekend. And uh, my video intro is not about racing today, and I just posted uh, a remembrance to all our heroes that make this country great as it is and uh, respecting all the people that has sacrificed to give us the freedom and liberty we all enjoy today. So that's the... Anyway, let me start with this. Hey, before we start with this video about the Cleveland Inn, I, I got something to say about this doggone <laughs> car. You know, back in the 80s, I remember everybody just about ran a flow muster muffler with an X pipe, H pipe, or whatever. But remember the, the five liter Mustangs which was outselling everything back back then because that's the age of the new modern muscle car era. The 5.0 revolution. And one thing is that the sound of the Flowmaster exhaust system, when you hear it go, blah, 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 you go, wow, that sounds sweet. And I remember this girl tells me before, your car is nice and it sounds real good. I go, just like you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, anything we do. <laughs> but anyway, and today, this Hellcat, Mustang, Camaro, what did they have? Doggone it. I mean, from the sound of the Flowmaster uh, exhaust on a Mustang, sounds so sweet. Like I said, this new cars, they have this, what do you call it? Wah, wah, a really raspy sound. And I'm going, what in the world are people sell these things? This thing sounds awful. It reminds me of the cherry bomb fiberglass glass back mufflers back then. They were they sounded horrendous. And these cars are even worse than that. You know, they have that uh, what do you call that uh, fart can sound. <laughs> and, I mean and then when they accelerate it goes pop 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 pop. I go, wow, what in the world is this? You gotta pop those mufflers in no time. Just a stupid thing, I, I feel. I mean, horrendous kind of sound. I don't even know if I can appreciate that. I mean, something's gotta change. I mean, go back to the side of the floor master or something similar. You know, something with a turbo muffler or, or whatever. Dynamax, they sound good. But today, or this video, excuse me with this hiccups, I still got it. Going on for two days. I had the doctor check me over, they couldn't find anything. I don't know what to do. But here we go. We'll talk about the Cleveland and how that engine or the cylinder head mainly 
was basically penalized by the sanctioning bodies from NASCAR to NHRA. Ah, oh, that's horrible. I mean, when somebody pulls up, well, for example, Glidden, uh, Jack Roush, uh, all, all Don, Don Nicholson, all the guys back then. Oh, excuse me. But this is not a Ford uh, versus Chevy video. I'm just highlighting what happened back in the day. History. We got to know what happened back then. Like, let's see where we're headed today so that we don't make the same stupid mistakes. Here, here we go. In the 80s, Glendon, all these guys, would have a pinup. Now, when you look at the Ford pinup with a Cleveland engine in it from Pro Stock, and then it pulls up uh, a big block, George St. Mary, Lee Shepard with the rare Morrison cars, Jenkins even switched to a big block. When they pull up, you look, you go, okay, you know, they have a minimum weight 2350, but actuality, the Cleveland's with their small block actually weigh more than the Camaros or the Dodges or anybody really, okay? The Cleveland powered machines had to, had to was penalized with added weight to equalize the competition, whatever that means, all right? To me, whoever builds the best thing, you go for it, all right? And the guys that could keep up, build a better engine, build a better cylinder head. To me, that's the proper, proper approach, not this jacking around, weight and stuff. So, when a Pinot small buck comes up to the line against a big block camera, he or she, if there's an overdriver problem, the weight more. Totally unfair. But why did this happen? What brought this about? When I highlight and explain what happened between the small block and the big block Camaros back then, we're not even talking about the small block Chevy. Early on, Lee Shepard, Jenkins, all these guys, Joseph, Mary, all these guys realized the small block cannot keep up with the Cleveland. Small block Chevy, small block Mar whatever. Due to the fact that the Cleveland or the Boss 302 or 351 Cleveland, Boss 351, they're the only small block with a canter valve engine or a canter valve head in production at that time. When, let me see, if this the cylinder wall, here's the valve, a typical Ford Windsor or Chevy or even some Dodges will open up like this, all right? There's a constant shrouding of the intake valve to the cylinder wall. What the Cleveland did was open the valve this way, all right? It's pulling away from the cylinder wall, giving more room for air and fuel to go in. Absolutely advantageous compared to any let me make that clear. Any small block inline arrangement, non canted valve hill. They realized they did not have any kind of competition. I remember one day somebody was racing me with a small block inline engine. All right? Windsor and it was a small block Chevy. They will not keep up. The only way you can keep up is to switch your engine. Here we are in Pro Stock in the 80s and the 70s. All the Chevy GM contingent decided we'll run the big block Chevy. This, this stroked it to get close to the Cleveland Fords. Uh, other people out there as well ended up running Cleveland engines on their Corvettes. Okay. Some modified production, some altered cars did that. Then NHRA jumped, jumped them and said, can't do that. Manufacturer has to be engine and body. You can't be switching around. And they were doing that. In fact, even the Ford guys, Glidden, ran a Pinto, right? Then it switched to a Monza and tried to make a make big power with a Chevy. And then pan out for him because, of course, he's a Ford, and, and he just gave up. Sold that car, that monster, to John Lincoln Felter, famous Chevy racer. John Lincoln Felter 
ran the car and I think altered or modified the production class. Guess what? With a Cleveland, he also got tagged. Boom, you can't do that. You gotta run a, a Chevy engine in a Chevy. They're trying to get around the weight brake. Okay? The penalty for running a Cleveland engine, here it is. That's just one year. Proceeding year, they keep changing. All right? And I, I don't know if you got awards for the Cleveland. I thought it was like 740, or something like that, for a Cleveland engine. Eventually, some of the four guys got frustrated. And, uh, you know, Maverick and Corvettes are not legal for posting because the engine, the driver sits too close to the rear, rear tire gives it an advantage for traction. So, with the added weight of the Ford Mavericks, well, when they allowed the Mavericks, at that time still a lot, a lot, a lot of them, <clears throat> they strapped so much weight that when Jack Rush came up, he had a four-door Maverick, because the stated rule was two-door Maverick. He came up with a four-door Maverick they called the Tijuana Taxi. efforts to compete at the same weight as the GM Mopar contingent and the AMC at that time was also there. They were doing all sorts of uh, quite crazy things to go around the, the ropes to try to cut weight off the, the Ford Cleveland engine and be competitive. In fact, 74-75, Bob Glidden and Dynadon came up with a 1970 Mach 1, again an older body style because the rules stated new body style for pro stock, but it didn't say anything about running an older car to basically get away from the added penalty of added running a Cleveland with more weight. But let me say something clear here. This is not a Ford versus Chevy video. I'm just trying to show history and why, because of pro stock and all the things that they realize, not GM, but the aftermarket building these heads realize that you gotta follow the peripheral port layout just like the Cleveland, right? One mimics the same. What that does is that all the, the cylinders are doing the same exact thing. As I've explained here on the Chevy Big Block, you have a left and right side port. The engine is a V8, but you got four short ports and you got four long ports. Definitely bad news. You're not gonna pick all at the same time. It's like a basketball team doing two different things instead of one goal to go to the other's basket. Hence, more power. It does not do that. All right. It. They're all over the place. This one here, and I will highlight on this video and explain what happened and then now with today's technology big block Chevy racing cylinder heads not the factory one and I created the aftermarket for that for having straight peripheral port small block and big block to have more competition That's outdated now. We got a lot more better cylinder heads from let's see one yays to some of these uh, cylinder heads that you know from some of these building that you build for a Chevy, big block, small block, 
ports, they're all different. But I all started with the high port, peripheral port layout. Okay, the Cleveland wasn't a hot port, but it was already, well, they had the tunnel port, which Ford did, also peripheral. But they went through the push rod area, so there's a tube in the middle of the port. <laughs> uh, it worked, supposedly. I haven't really tested it. I haven't even seen any flow numbers over there, but it made power, supposedly. It was illegal, just like the 427 single already cam kind of engine. NASCAR said it's illegal for NASCAR, not for oval track. Too much of an advantage. There was a peripheral port, no push rod hole because of the overhead cam. Was 429? That's another story. Also peripheral port. Most, if not all, pro stock heads today are not the true Hemi. They are patterned after the semi Hemi Boss 429 head. It's not a in like intake to exhaust, it's tilted. Where Okay, it creates a little bit of mixture motion and then the exhaust not in line with the intake, it doesn't come back into a reversion contamination of the intake port. It kind of limits that uh, scenario. And I'll explain that in this vid video. All in all, we learn from experience, from competition, which is the, be the better way to skin the cat, like they say. Rifle port, high port. All these things come into play now. Right? And I will highlight this video and what I see and what I feel uh, transform the industry to a better products coming out there for all engine makes. Alright? And actually Pro Stock, even Dodge is not running a true Hemi, I think. It's a semi Hemi as well. The, the true Hemi will not be competitive. It'll make peak power, but somewhere down the line. It's, it's lacking in the mid-range RPM pool, especially for NA. For blown, nitro, methanol, whatever, it's correct. But it's not great for everything. There are exceptions. Pro stock, especially. NA racing. Anyway, before we proceed on the main subject matter of this video, let me just put another story. I, I get a lot of feedback from you guys. We were guys are telling stories of all our crazy experiences and we all have all these pretty interesting stories to, to talk about. Anyway, I have a 70 Mach 1 with a 351 Cleveland with this big ports like here and uh, it's a four speed top loader. And I'll tell you what, I've given rides to some of my friends when I'm warming up my race car around the block. Where I used to live right there by Atwater, and I gun it, and then we go, Oh, yeah, this is this is crazy. But the 70, it's a street car, it'll go 1080, low 11 at that time. But one thing with a high revving small block with big ports, I got 514 gears in it, and I leave out of the line. I know this big intake port don't have much of a, a low speed mid range, but the amazing part is, yeah. This, it is summertime. You know, flies running around here trying to bomb my head. <laughs> anyway, hey, so this Cleveland big port, close chamber, 514 gears with a top loader. I don't know if any of you have experience running a car with a top loader or a big block Chevy or, or Chrysler with a four speed, you know, Liberty, whatever, Muncie. Well, one thing with, with this doggone top loader is that when I'm going down on the block and every time I shift, I'm floored and I pull the gear and I sidestep my clutch. Crazy. I don't let off the clutch. I sidestep it. And when I shift it goes boom, boom, boom. You could hear it. I'm going down the block or you could just about feel it. It's Everybody's laughing about it. But anyway, one thing is that the guy I grew up with through high school, um, he had got a Corvette, a 65, with a small block, 327. That sucker was fast. And we'd street trace everybody. And every time we're hang, hanging around together, they will pick on my my Torino <laughs> with a small block. But actually, it's very quick for that time. And then I switched that over to a 60, 
some body style utilizing the 351. But they're always pick on me not knowing that this little wizard is actually faster than the Corvette. has a 69302Z28 and I gave him a ride in it and he goes man I never had any respect with this doggone Ford but this one's quick and then when I gave him a ride on my 70 he just about blew his his gasket it was going holy cow and I was shifting a 7500 on a streetcar this is 1979 yeah yeah 78 and he was like blown away like wow this thing is fast and I said is the I think it's the at that time I go I think it's because of the big gigantic ports and I tell you what when it hits about 5500 6500 it starts to haul beans I mean that's when I realized okay this big port big intake I had an 850 carburetor on it it requires gears they don't work at the lower RPM it starts to, to buck get the, it's got too much port but once you get it going and get on the rpm oh my god it, it, it is um something else that's what i had an appreciation for friends of mine chevy and four guys alike when they drive all right with me the mach one they're going okay this is there's a whole, completely different animal and that's it that's why when you look at a super modified nhl a b super modified is basically filled with big block big block chevys in that class and guess who's right there in the middle bsm mike edwards arlen fadley you know all those guys uh, uh running bsm or don boss a super modified they're duking it out with a big block and that was a canton valve but straight out to layout right? they put some stroke in it but you see there's no world for in inline valves there. They're all canted valve. That's the only superior way. Now we'll see why and how that happened right here. Damn these hiccups. <laughs> now we're talking about the gigantic intake ports on the Ford. <laughs> Look at that. That's a small block huge that's a big block rectangular port if you notice they even put some epoxy here to raise the port and kicked it up much higher and welded the roof the Fords they hardly did anything in fact some of them would also put epoxy to try to shrink it down a bit but I wonder if good into them guys Roush you know uh, what's the name uh, Dyna Don Nicholson. I wonder if they did even epoxy that. I don't see any reason really because you need a lot of port for high RPM. Anyway, you're looking at that. I haven't flow tested this not only because my flow bridge kind of screwed up. I have to get those new die uh, to fill up the, the manometer and all that stuff. Um, I kind of figured they're pretty much close to each other. Uh, potentially wise all right so look at this thing massive this is also massive and if I would say if this was a rectangular port the intake port would be this high right here for the factory all right so um, the potential is there intake port volume at that time in the 60s 70s bigger is better now we found out that uh, higher port angle is better with a medium sized port as opposed to this humongous intake ports. I don't even know how many cc's this displaces but it's quite a bunch. <laughs> but I tell you what, my street car, my trip to Cleveland, I'd leave the line at 7500 RPM. I got a Lincoln Continental, Lincoln Continental, Continental 9 inch housing up back with a top loader. Every time I grab the gear I don't let off on the gas, I just sidestep the clutch 
boom, the whole box opens up. I almost got to crack the windshield if I keep this going. <laughs> but the whole dashboard. I actually scared more people in my Cleveland Mach 1 than my actual race car when I gave my friends a, a ride around the block where I used to live out there in Atwater by Griffith Park. And they were more scared of the Mach 1 than the doggone race car. Amazing, I guess that stick ship. And you know, uh, if you're standing on the back and I leave and I pull the gear, while I'm going down the block, you feel this. <laughs> That's the typical top loader. Uh, should I say reputation. While you're going down, you go boom, boom. Amazing. There's nothing like it. You can never equal that with an import or today's muscle car. Just something else. Now let's go to the combustion chamber. I wonder. Huh. Anyway, you know, sometimes when a guy like me who's bored, got nothing better to do than to stare at a cell on their head and wonder, hey, why is that better or why is that worse? I guess I'm a freak. <laughs> but anyway, hey, I cannot take it as it is. I always gotta look for something. I'm not being super critical. I just want to know why. I want to understand. But I've looked at this two cylinder heads since they're competing head to head back then. Small block versus big block. And I'm going, man, both of this stroked, but this thing still has the ultimate advantage. That's why it's penalized by added weight by NHRA. Now, here we go. Why is this an advantage? One thing. You look at see this crossover angle see this crossover angle see this is more that's like 1230 not even it's like one o'clock when you have the exhaust over here and the intake over here, that's called a Hemi. Ultimately, that has the most potential, all out potential. The more you tilt, plus 429 Hemi, SC1, some of the NASCAR heads from Chrysler, SB2, Cleveland, Twisted Wedge, inline engines, Windsor, standard, you know, Chevy, Chrysler. The more this is tilted, the potential and the RPM potential and power goes up. This shows its advantage over here. I don't know if you can see it or can I realize it from that angle now. Okay, but it is there. You cannot deny that. You're, except maybe for the Pro King, but since the, the port is so high, even though it's an inline, it's a dump straight down to the combustion chamber. But if you put this or the SE one as high as the Pro King, which I think they are, they still have the advantage. When you look at some of these guys who are making these billet heads, the SE one still got the upper hand compared to Pro King. I'm not saying Pro King is slouch, it's very impressive, but when you have the valve again that opens up not in line with a cylinder wall but off to the side and allows more air to come in you're not going to beat that just like today when you look at the twisted wedge even for streets i've seen a lot of dyno tests out there and i prefer the twisted wedge uh, and then secondly the afr but for street use hard to beat when you move that intake valve from here in line to here you're taking it away from the cylinder wall. You're basically unshrouding it. And the twisted wedge shows its potential. Even on street RPM, street compression ratios, they have a distinct advantage. Now, here you go. You look at probably in the 60s, mid 60s, uh, CC on combustion chamber. This has started at 118, 123, or 124. But they have to unshroud it, even though they melt it big time, still a big combustion chamber. I don't have the valves anymore that I can 
accurately measure this, but I think I'm looking at probably 80 cc, 85 cc. Far cry from 60, 65 cc. Now we don't appreciate combustion chamber volume or cc. You're missing a whole lot. Back in the early 90s when the first Yates came out, I ordered a set. And when I got it, it came with this. This is how a Yates looks like when it came from the factory, just like when I had it in 1991. There's hardly anything there. So you gotta figure it out. No ports, no valves, <laughs> no nothing. And I call them up, they come, you're on your own, let us know how it works for drag racing. Oh, great, now I'm in it. I'm in it more than I can chew, man, I can. But anyway, I ended up with a 40cc combustion chamber, tiny. I did not use the flow bench because I know for a fact the flow bench will always tell me I made some improvements, go bigger, go bigger. Now you're 300 CFM, make it bigger, 327, oh, great. Make it bigger, 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 bigger. There's a point of diminishing returns. And then if your displacement is not that big, you're falling off a cliff real quick. Anyway, about the story about combustion chamber. So here, here I am with a 40cc combustion chamber. I didn't even put on the flow bench. It was this, in fact. This sucker is old. It's like my grandpa. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a word ball to a veteran. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so here we go. I ended up looking at the head ports, the intake port, how I think I, I like it to shape-wise and everything. And I ran that car at about 2,800 pounds, if I remember correctly, 2,850, 2,800, no, no, some lighter than 27. That dog got car went 930 at about 149. That is fast, 938 to be exact. So I pulled it out. I put on the flow bench, and I go, wow, there's something wrong with this flow bench. It flowed very little. I put another head on, and I think I even took it to another friend of mine, just to confirm. The numbers was 283 at 50. I mean, 283 at 50. 283 CFM at 28 inches. That's street level, or uh, airflow. It did run as much as the airflow said it would. It was really <laughs> embarrassingly low, to tell you the truth. But flow is not everything. Combustion chamber is one of the big aspects of this whole thing. I come to realize at that point in time, my friend Oz Anderson, who's got the patent for the swirl and, and uh, uh, tumble meter to hook up on the flow benches, we happen to um, share a room out there at one of the engineering conferences and my mentor Chuck Stevens or Charles Stevens would purposely put us together in the same room so we could you know uh, have a gearhead discussion and we did all night all weekend anyway when I called him up I said you won't believe this uh, I read this fast go, oh, okay he, he was a an old engineer from Chrysler and surprisingly I go I only flowed 283 and the car went 930 at almost 150 miles an hour NA and then I told him to wait he goes okay my next question is how big is the combustion chamber whammo he nailed it he said your combustion chamber is small right I go yeah that being said he goes at 283 CFM with a 40 cc combustion chamber, your car functioned like it had a, a standard head, you know, with a big combustion chamber, full on 340, 360, which is big at that time in the 90s. To get to that level, that's pro stock times or, or, you know, flow numbers at that time for a small block. So I had a realization the combustion chamber does, does play an important fact. Now, when you have this small combustion chamber, 
it gets evacuated when the exhaust valve opens up a lot easier than this big chamber. It takes a longer time to take it out. Correct? Not only that, when you initiate combustion chamber, it spreads real fast on a smaller compact area and the heat is contained in a small compact area and pushes down to the piston. It's dissipated on this big combustion chamber. Now it's amazing, isn't it? It's able to evacuate because it's smaller. And the big combustion chamber requires a bigger dome. A smaller combustion chamber requires a smaller dome. The net result is a lighter piston. Now, when you have a lighter piston, sh surely the connecting rod is probably going to be a little shorter as well, or long from stock, but shorter in regards to the bigger engine, or a taller deck. So what happens there is that there's less heat loss on a compact chamber like a Yates, a lot of heat loss here, and also when you have the spark starting over here, spark starting over there, while it's spreading this way, this is the last area to get to get combusted. The bigger the bore, the farther away and the bigger the chamber, it takes longer to get there, quicker to get here, secondary pressure temperature spikes back. You start your detonation area right there. Amazing, isn't it? Then when you look at the ability See this block is short, that's longer. Meaning, since this has got a taller deck, it's got a longer rod, a heavier piston, a heavier rod, and a longer crank, and a heavier crank at that as well. This is shorter in every way. Hey, she said it was shorter. Oh, that's bad news. <laughs> but anyway, hey, let's go back to serious business. She said it's short. <laughs> anyway, no, uh, let's go back to serious business. Now. When it's shorter, it's definitely lighter. That's heavier. So, let me try to break it down in this way. If I have an identical me, a, a similar me or my twin, we have the same theoretical potential. Power in our legs, manpower or horsepower. We have the same potential in our legs, same body. We will have basically will run the same equivalent time. But, here's a true sense of the word. Like the big block Chevy, if my uh, twin ends up putting on combat boots, meaning heavier rod, heavier piston, heavier crack, and I get to put sneakers, and we're gonna do a 100 yard dash or maybe a 50 yard dash, who do you think is gonna get there first? We have basically the same horsepower, or close to it, I'm going to whip his butt. Because I can sprint out of there real quick, due to my lighter, lighter load. I have less losses. If, if my other self is running combat boots, there's no way in the world I can do that. I'll probably trip and fall on my face, but once you're I'm lighter, you know, uh, sneakers or something like that, can't beat me. You're on combat boots, can't beat me. Not gonna work. This is what was in front of us during those times. Bigger block, heavier crank, requires bigger dome, bigger combustion chamber, heavier piston, heavier rod. Everything's in reverse with this guy. Plus ultimately, a small combustion chamber and this theoretical tilt. Okay, the more you tilt, tilt is this way, the RPM potential and horsepower goes up big time. Okay, to a certain point, a Hemi NA will not function as good as a semi Hemi post 429 type. That's why when you look at all these new cylinder heads, you know, they're somewhat this way, like the SC1 or even the big block Chevy heads, you know, the, the billet ones and the big block Ford heads. They're more like Boss 429 layout. The reason for a Hemi, whatever goes in, 
wants to revert back and contaminate the intake. Next shot, because it's a straight shot. It's a mirror image in, out comes back. When you tilt it this way, the reversion potential to contaminate the intake port is a lot less, okay? But at high RPM, it's able to transition and process the air fuel mixture and get it out of there. Here, it's more of a drastic turn than that. And the worst of all, are the, are the, <laughs> are the same flow type heads like the 280Z, where the intake comes in this way, makes a 90 degree turn and 90 degree turn out. So go like this, okay? The potential is not there to even produce power. It would, if you boost it, everything with, with boost is gonna produce. But NA, or when you build a real good NA engine, then you just make the adjustments on compression and camshaft, and now you boost it, you're up ahead of the guy that doesn't know the basics. Anyway, now I got the much modified version of both heads that dominated racing back in the early years, up to the 80s, early 90s. We start here on the left. Big block Chevy, standard port height, even the rectangular port had similar exhaust size and, and uh, height. And look at here. The original exhaust port is right about there. And it went up about half an inch of that. I think it's half an inch. Anyway, significantly racing the port, exhaust port, picked up a bunch of power because of the uh, uh, enhanced exhaust flow potential. Remember, uh, it's also known out there that when you do uh, theoretical engine potential by CFM. They always think and use intake CFM, let's say a 28 or 10 or five as a reference. Then they put their calculation and you come up with theoretical engine potential. That's nice, but that's outdated. What you gotta look at and what everybody has failed to see is the ability of this exhaust port to yank on the intake column much more than the piston would be. And when you have a high port, you have to change your uh, low separation angles because you'll have a lot of intake overdraw to the exhaust. You pull raw fuel out here. It's too good. Now, Cleveland, there's the exhaust port height back then. And here is the port plate. If I remember correctly, I think Bud Moore started this thing. Bud Moore of NASCAR fame started this uh, exhaust port plate. Also, the potential has increased with a cylinder head. How much power? I heard 60, 80, as much as 100. Is that believable? Perhaps. It depends how you play your, your separation angles. If you have an engine here, let's say in Cleveland here or small block Chevy or whatever, and you're 108, 110 lobe separation, thereby you have a pretty good amount of overlap. When you switch to these heads, a lot of people, and I made that mistake years ago, when I switched to the then new Yates in 1991, I had the same kind of cam grind as far as lobe separation angles or lobe center lines on the intake and exhaust. Uh, I did not use that because I was unaware at that time. But I would have gained a little bit more power given that fact that if I was aware. But I wasn't at that point in time. When you switch from this head, this head, to this too, you got to really kind of limit that overlap. Okay, and uh, so you don't have any uh, intake overdraw to the exhaust or kind of limit that. And you can see here, there's a drastic, drastic difference. Look how high that is. Look also the same thing. A lot of people complain about the Cleveland because it hacked off a big portion of one side of the head. 
well, a big, well, probably almost an inch and a half to put these plates on. This one here, they just welded on the existing uh, casting. Two different things, but the process is still the same. They raise the ports to unrealistic levels. <laughs> Please uh, share, <laughs> watch my video, uh, like, uh, please do that. So uh, we'll keep doing this thing. I like this uh, in-depth uh, talking head type <laughs> uh, tech video. So anyway, please do that and uh, have a good day. Have a good Memorial Weekend, guys. Let's remember our heroes. Let's thank them for what country we have today. Thank you very much.